This is Daryl Ehrlich, editor of the Billings Gazette, and this is part of our Vietnam Voices series. Thanks so much for tuning in and listening. Uh, today I have Elwin Valley with me. Elwin is, uh, served in the U.S. Army from 1962 to 1965, and I'm glad that he's here because he's he's got a a, uh, a perspective that is even earlier than most people who were over in Vietnam. He he saw some some things leading up to it, and I'm excited to tell his story today. So, Elwin, thank you so much for being a part of this. Thank you for being here with me. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> Great. Well, let's start. At, let's start before 1962. What were you? Do, where were you? And what were you doing before 1962? I, lived, I was born in Clear Lake, Iowa, and I lived in Redfield, South Dakota, when I got drafted. Okay. And you got drafted. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, did you know that Vietnam was going on at the time? A little bit. Not there. Was, it wasn't in the headlines much, but yes, especially after you went in the service, you learned about. Vietnam. You learned where Vietnam was, on it. Yeah. Did you want to go into the service? Was was the military on your horizon? Oh yes, I was ready to go. I got called my draft notice, and I went to the draft board, and they said, "Well, you go down to Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and take your physical." And if you pass your physical, you'll get called about December. So that was six months away, and I thought, what am I going to do for six months while I'm waiting this? So I volunteered and, and went three years and went in right. I took my physical and went in Wow. that day. Wow. Were you nervous? No, I don't think so. Okay. I was, I was you know, a little concerned, but not nervous, not scared. Okay. I was older than most. Okay. How old were you when you I went in? I was 20 when I got drafted. Okay. So they, you, later on, they were drafting them at 18, 19. Right. Yeah. Right. So you were older. Uh, where did you go to basic? And then well, from when, when, after you took your physical, then what? Then I went to basic training at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. Hmm. And then I went to Fort Gordon, Georgia, and went to the Army Signal School, the same place that Chuck Tooley went. Okay. Same MOS. And I think of 200 graduates at Fort Gordon, 12 of us went to Vietnam. Wow. <laughs> That's they picked the top 12 graduates and shipped us. <laughs> Did they? So uh, you you got your notice to go over to Vietnam right after? Right uh, at after the signal, signal School at Georgia. Okay. Yeah. So talk a little bit about what you learned to do at Signal School. What do you? What does someone do at, with that MOS? Uh, we were taught radio communications, all kinds of it. Uh, okay. The different radio uh, rigs from big 500-watt transmitting stations down to little backpack, carry it on your back rigs. Okay. So we were communications people. Okay. And then uh, from there, you got your notice to go to this place called Vietnam? I got orders to go to Vietnam in January of 63. Okay, January of 63, again, a lot of people in January of 63 are more worried about Cuba and the Russians than they are Vietnam, we right? We went through the Cuban Missile Crisis. I was at Fort Gordon, Georgia, Okay. when that happened. Okay. That was more scary than Vietnam was. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, being in the military yeah, that, on the East Coast. During... You had to say, what's going to happen here? Why am I here? We were only... 200 miles from Cuba. <laughs> right, right, right. What, um, so you were more worried about that than, say, somewhere in Vietnam, because had you really been briefed on what was going on in Vietnam? We didn't know anything about what was going on. They confined us to the company area, and we sat around for a week and had no— I mean, we, people, some people had radios, and but there really wasn't much even on the radio about what was going on. And we just, we knew that there was problems in Cuba and until Kennedy come on the radio and said, on television and said what had happened, we were pretty much in the dark. But they, they lined all the trucks up in the parade field on the fort and we were confined to company area and we knew something was going on. Right, right. So, so you're we went through that. <laughs> right, so you were more worried about, you were thinking Cuba, not, not, East yeah, Asia, Southeast invading Asia. Invading Cuba wasn't a probably a bit the best idea we ever had. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like we we made a few bad decisions along the way. Yeah. So then uh, let's talk about shipping out. How did you get to Vietnam? We went to Oakland Army Terminal, flew out of Travis Air Force Base to Honolulu, spent the night there, 
flew to the Philippines, fueled up and had lunch and landed in Saigon the next day. Okay, what do you remember about that flight over there and what do you remember about Saigon? It was a brand new 707. That airplane was so beautiful. <laughs> and it was the first time I'd ever flown. Okay. Uh, it was pretty exciting. Yeah, yeah. So you're going over there because you, you don't necessarily know that there's going to be a war there, right? Are you just going over as a as military support, or do you know that there's— Well, we knew it wasn't going to be a picnic. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Nobody packed a lunch. <laughs> right, right. Uh, but— uh, I'm sure that there was a lot of concern in people's minds, but still, it was kind of exciting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you went over there not really knowing a whole lot about what's going to go That's on, though, right? right? Okay, so you land, you you you're over in this new 707. You land in Saigon. What's Saigon like when you get off the plane to a South Dakota boy? Well, who's the man that was in Saturday's paper? Uh, 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 that one was uh, well. There was Ernie Flynn who was in Sunday. And then on Saturday there was uh, uh, who who was sorry I'm I'm blanking. I got it written down here. <laughs> he said, <laughs> you know. and I said the same thing. Flynn or wasn't his name Flynn? Yeah, yeah, Ernie was in Sunday. Yep. Yeah, Ernie Flynn. Yep. He said it was the smell. Really. And I can tell Ernie what that smell was. Okay, what was it? That smell was rancid water, rotting vegetation human waste, and diesel fuel. Wow. And once it's stuck in your nostrils and your sinuses, you'll never get it out. <laughs> really? You're still smelling it today? Yes. Yeah, so huh. If I got time to reminisce? Yep, absolutely. Years ago, three of us, Stan Thompson and I and another guy, were standing at the auto auction out here. And it was a hot July morning, and they had mowed this alfalfa field, and then it rained hard that night. And we're standing out there. Conrad Anderson was the other one. And we're standing out there watching the cars go through. And Conrad said, it smells like Vietnam. Hmm. And I said, you're right. How did you know that? He said, I was there in 64. Tim Thompson said, I was there in 69. <laughs> and none of us knew the other one had ever been there. Huh. No. <laughs> wow. That's kind of the way it's been. People didn't know. You didn't. They, didn't, they, they don't tell anybody. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Uh, believe it or not, people don't want to hear about it. Hmm. It's something they just as soon leave back there and forget it. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why I'm kind of surprised that this these interviews went over so well. Is because a lot of guys have kept this for 30, 50 years to yeah. themselves. Yeah. Even their families don't know about it. Yeah, yeah, that's that. That's absolutely true. We're finding that out. Yeah, absolutely. What? Um. So you get off the plane, and then what happens when well, Saigon? Get off the plane, and uh, another good little story. Well, you get off the plane, and you go into this building, and then this lieutenant colonel comes in and gives you the little briefing about you are a visitor in a foreign land, you know, and <laughs> and behave yourself. <laughs> what am I to do? And then they load you on trucks and take you to your either a holding station or to your unit if your unit happened to be at Tonsonute Air Base. And so we get in this truck and there's 20 of us and we're going up this highway. And Vietnam was over very there, it was a modern city with four lane highways and all kinds of good stuff. And we're riding in this truck trying to get our bearings of where are we and what's this like. And here's this big billboard alongside the highway that said Bastos cigarettes. I always remember it. If you ever smoked a Bastos cigarette, you quit smoking. <laughs> <laughs> that good, huh? <laughs> and at the, at the bottom of this sign in the corner, there was a little sticker that said wall drug 9,900 miles. Oh. <laughs> and I thought, Somebody was here before me, had a sense of humor, I'll live through this. Right, right. <laughs> and, and Waldrug, being a South Dakota native, you knew exactly yeah. where that was. Yeah. <laughs> so you get to, where are you stationed? Say again. Where are you stationed in Vietnam? Where did you get well, to? Well, our home company was at Tonsonut Air Base, tells about it, and then they sent me to the 7th Advisory Team at Baklu, which was south about, I don't know, 80, 90 miles, way down in the delta in the jungle. And I was down there for, I don't know how long, a month. Okay. And then I spent a month in the 8th Field Hospital. Why? 
I uh, was the only hospital around. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Were you sick? Were you hit? I was injured. Okay. How'd you get injured? Well, we don't want to go into this. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let me tell you. Okay. A few years ago when I was writing this, mm -hmm. a friend of mine, Mitch Hansen, he just retired from Wolverine Boot Company, and he was in Special Forces, and he was in Vietnam when I was there, although I never met him. And I met okay. several Vietnam uh, Special Forces people because we furnished equipment for them. And I told him I was writing this, and I said, I don't know exactly how to write it. And he said, write it just like it was, just as nasty and ugly as it was. And I thought, okay, I'll try that. So I wrote this episode in Baklu, and then I decided this doesn't do anybody any good, me or the reader, even if there is no readers, but I got it off my chest. Right. <laughs> and I threw it away. Okay. And Fair. I leave it there. It's gone. It's no longer part. Great. I can move on. Okay, so you got back up, uh, then then you're back at Tonsonute, right? Back at Tonsonute. Okay, so what's what, what's your kind of daily job? What, My what daily job is that I was in charge of the emergency radio squad. I had eight people that worked for me or with me, and they run the emergency radio network that was on the air 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And it was a major means of communication. See, we had 25 advisory teams stationed all over South Vietnam. And these advisors, like I was in the seventh, these advisory teams, there was about, probably, it varied, but there was like 20 advisors and then a whole bunch of support people. There was probably 50 people at every advisory team, several officers, a lot of high-ranking NCOs. And we furnished communications and equipment and everything else that they needed to keep those 25 advisory teams. And then, to make it funny, one of our advisory teams was in Korea. Okay. <laughs> I never understood that. <laughs> right, right. So, we had an air taxi service that covered the entire country every day. Hmm. You could go down to the airport and get on a plane and fly south, or you get on a different plane and fly north. And they landed at each advisory station that either had something to be dropped off or someone there or something to be picked up and they made the loop and it was just like riding a bus except for an airplane and if you had to go to uh, to song b and deliver a radio or something and you'd tell the pilot i'll be an hour and he said, don't worry about it we'll be here when you get back and we can go do our business and come back get on the plane and fly the next wow that's not that's nice when you have your airplane waiting for you, you. saw a lot of country and then if you was going to be a long time they'd make their loop and if you was on the down end of it they'd pick you up on the way back huh <laughs> wow worked pretty good and they were good people that really did a good job. And I flew a lot of miles there to all these stations. And the only station we drove to was Benoit. Okay. That was about 35 miles from Saigon, maybe a little less than that. And you could fly there. They had an airstrip. But we get in the truck and drive there. And I told about driving to Benoit and that. Yeah. Tell me. Can you tell that story? Let's tell that story. Tell yeah. Me, tell me about driving to Benoit. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's when the, that's where we were when the coup started at Benoit. Yeah, I'm going to come back to that. But I uh, was there any sense of when? Well, let's let me back up. Were the advisors were they advising the South Vietnamese Army, or what did the advi What were the advisors doing? The Seventh Advisory Team was a, an advisory group to the First Infantry Vietnam Division, and they went out and. You know, some of them should have been advising us. Right. What the hell do we know about it, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, they did planning and operations, and I don't, I don't know all they did. Okay. But they don't tell you all they do. Right. But our advisor team, we had a lieutenant colonel. Wright was our CO. And you got to be a pretty upscaled advisory team to have a lieutenant colonel as a team yeah. leader. Yeah. And they'd go out to the field once in a while. Okay. Sometimes they'd be out in the field a long time. And uh, whatever they did, 
I guess they were good at it. <laughs> <laughs> was there any sense of, I mean, when, when I talked to the, the soldiers who were there in 65, 66, when we had actual combat troops, was, uh, and you were there for a little bit in 60, were you there in 65 in Vietnam? No. no? Okay. Was it, was there a sense of danger? Were there people shelling you or shooting at you? Oh, in at Bach Lu, yeah. we were locked in at night. Okay. You didn't play any place unarmed. Okay. I, and you didn't go to breakfast unarmed. <laughs> right. What were you? What what uh, what gun were you trained on? We started out. What guns? Yeah. Well, when I went to Baklu, I took a forty-five caliber machine gun and an M1 carbine. Okay. That was my weapons down there, and I I didn't bring my picture of them, but I have pictures of these things. Okay. I mean, there was weapons every place. Right. Yeah. Right. So, uh, so you would travel around to these spots. What did you think of Vietnam? What, what was your impression of Vietnam? The northern part along the ocean was beautiful. Mm -hmm. Saigon was a fantastic city. Yeah? I could have lived there. I mean, Why? What, tell, tell me about that. Tell me about what Saigon it was. was. It was a modern city except for their sewage system probably. <laughs> That's what I've heard. <laughs> right on the, the, the harbor was there. And my favorite place was the Street of Flowers, they called it. And it was, Saigon had a real French uh, background to it because the French were there for 100 years. And you could open air cafes and flower pots and people coming. Saigon was a busy town. There was a million people that lived in a space the size of Billings. And it yeah. was a bustle. And it was exciting. Yeah. Yeah, could you get? Uh, would you be able to go off base and go through it, or spend any time there? Oh, well, we could go into Saigon. Okay, that was it. Okay, yeah. yeah. So uh, you would go around and you would do these these uh, drops and, and yeah. with radios different, and work with that. Bases, yes. Yeah. Was that exciting work, or what? How how would you classify the work that you did there? It was busy work, and yeah, it was a little exciting, but it was interesting. Yeah, well, to go someplace and see something different, but uh, most of it, you went from the air base and you flew to where you were going to, and you went to where the the advisory team was, and you did what you had to do, and you left. You weren't there for a picnic. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. What did you miss about home? What what what? I did, were you homesick for anything? Yes. What? Milk. Really. <laughs> I haven't had a glass of milk in eight months, eight and a half months. Wow. <laughs> you really, some people really miss milk. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> did. They had powdered milk, Ooh. which was absolutely putrid. Yeah. That's another thing. I never drank a glass of water in Vietnam. Okay. Ever. Would, would you drink? Coca-Cola and black velvet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I could have, I could subsist. In fact, I have subsisted on a diet like that at times. <laughs> what was the food like? The army food was edible. The Vietnamese food was good. Really? Oh, I thought it was. Yeah, it was, I've we, heard. We'd go to town looking for food. They had the okay. best chicken soup, chicken rice soup you ever ate in your life. Huh. Yeah. I mean, they threw the whole chicken in, feet and all, you know, but it was absolutely fantastic. I imagine so, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so you got to, what were the people like in Vietnam? What were the, the people? Because if you're in Saigon and you're eating there, you probably got to interact a little with the people, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. what, what were the people like in Vietnam at the time? Like most people. Uh, okay. Mostly were friendly, well-educated. Uh, I was amazed at how many spoke English. Hmm. All the officers in the military, the Vietnamese military spoke English, or not, maybe not all of them, but most of them because they were trained here in the United States. They'd right. been training over here for 10 years. Right. And so you know, you're not much of a language problem. They picked up English pretty fast. They liked English language. They liked Americans. Americans had money. Right. Yeah. <laughs> money makes a lot of difference. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that the truth? Now, yeah. on the other side, Baklu. Right. Uh, Baklu was the armpit of Vietnam. I mean, it was down there. At the, at the airport, it said, Welcome to Baklu International Airport, elevation three feet, wet season minus three feet. It was a soggy, stinking, rotten hole. You wouldn't want to live there. Right, right, uh, right. And uh, and so 
uh, most of the time you were happy to be somewhere like Tonson Newt, right? I mean, oh yeah, up, up Tonson a, Newt was this was joyous duty compared to a lot of it. Yeah, yeah. Did you when you were there? Did you get the sense that when you were there? Did you ever think we're going to be involved in a 10-year war here? Could you see it coming? Yeah? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. The Vietnamese were kind of laid back about the war. They'd been fighting it for I don't know how many years. They fought the French for 100 years and threw them out. And now they got a new interloper here, two of them, the communists on the north and the Americans on the south. Right. And they were in a no-win situation. They knew that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit. You were there during the coup, right? Take me, let's start a little bit before the coup and then take me through what happened, because it's a fascinating story um, that you were around right as that change of of dictatorship or 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 (laughs) democracy, change of government, the change of government. Walk me through that whole story, because it's just a fast. I'm fascinated by it. I was kind of fascinated by it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I read uh, to, for people who don't see, who don't uh, hear on these interviews. Elwin has written a a book about uh, his reminiscence, and they it's a fascinating read. What just it, it's spooky. I think it, you know, as I was reading, I thought this is this is a little scary. I would have been pretty spooked by the whole thing. We were in a serious situation because our people were spread out all over the country, and. If the Vietnamese government turned against us, how were we going to get them back right. and out of there? And they weren't huge numbers, right? I mean, they were no, they pockets of— The advisory teams out there were 100 men here and 50 men there, and, and they were in the, back in the bushes and in the jungles. And how would they get back to the harbor? And even if the Seventh Fleet did come in, they were in serious position. Right, right. So let's talk about uh, what, uh, l- let's go a little bit. How did you know something was coming, and then let's le- go up to the time of the coup? So Well, the, there had been two previous attempts on DM's life, be, one just before I got there and one a few years before that. They tried to kill him, and the word gets around. We, we monitored, I told you that, we monitored UPI and UPS, and we knew what was going on. Right. Yeah, we knew that there were serious go- problems with the government. But when, when DM's troops attacked the Buddhists and killed several 20, 30 Buddhists, and then they declared martial law, and our, Saigon was off limits except during the daytime, and even going into Saigon, you went in armed. We like to stay on the base. It was a pretty tense situation. Right, and he tried to, DM tried to blame that on, did he try to blame that on Viet Cong or NVA? Or did, yeah, he didn't, the, the DM government didn't take responsibility for that, did they? The Buddhist attacks? Well, they did later because right. they got, they got uh, ousted, yeah. <laughs> they had, uh, DM had his palace guard, which was his special troops that was to protect the president. They dressed up in regular army uniforms and attacked Buddhist monasteries in three different places in Vietnam. And the next day, hell, the word got out. You can't hide something like that. Right. (laughs) The word got out real quick. Right. That that he orchestrated this, and that's when the big push was to take him out of office. Right. Right. So you knew, so there was, you you saw it be the beginning of unrest. Yes. And it got, was that scary when things, when Saigon kind of went down on lockdown and, and. Oh, it was, it raised the concern level about up to the nine scale. <laughs> right. What was it like uh, during those tense times? What was it like on base? I mean, what what, what was. Oh, the, the base was a, was busy. There was airplanes and trucks and cars and people, and, and it, it, it was a busy place. So the, the concern there was that there's only a few of us, and there's a whole lot of them. So, right. like I said in the book, we never left the company area unarmed. Right. No, never. 
Yeah. Was there any communication with the State Department back to the Army about what was going on? Because yeah, well, they, that was way above us. Right. Yeah. You just you just were kind of waiting for the next. Yeah, we were down there in the in the you do it stuff. Right. <laughs> All the planning up there. And then you do it, right? Yeah. So let's let's walk up. So there had been a few there had been a few attempts on Diem's life, and then there was the the Buddhist uh, monastery, and then what happened? Well, right. then. The commanding generals decided they were going to oust him, and there was a lot of planning, like it says in the book, that we didn't know about, but they uh, had to shut down all the Air Force because you can't carry out a coup and overthrow the government if you got planes bombing you. So they sent, I think it says in there, they sent that we had a helicopter assault team across from us, and all of a sudden they were gone. Well, the commanding general had them sent way up north out of the area, and then they just uh, closed Tonsonute Air Base to flights by gunfire. Hmm. Anything that moved there, they shot at it. Wow. And they were here, and we were here, and the air base was here. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about between a rock and a hard place, very weren't you? rock and a very hard spot, yeah. What's the uh, 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 so they they shut it down? Does that have the people for you? Because that means no flying for you too for the for the U.S. That's there. I don't think I understood. Did 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 the art? Were you guys shut down when they when they closed the airfield? Did that mean you guys were shut down from flying too? Oh, nothing moved. Wow. No airplanes flew anyplace. I mean, it shut down civilian flights and military flights. And nothing flew. Hmm. Absolutely. Wow, that's scary because that's they're, really scary because how are you going to get out or get you get can't to people? get out of here without either an airplane or a ship? <laughs> right. So we were kind of stuck in a right. So then they start the coup and where? Tell me about that. Tell me what's going on because uh, that that gets pretty pretty hairy and in, in, well, in, yeah. We knew, first knew about it when we left Benoit and the army was forming up on the road between Benoit and Saigon. Yeah, and we left. They made us stay at Benoit overnight, and then the next morning, Chuck Young and I left, and we get out on the highway. You want me to go clear? Yeah, that? yeah, I, I absolutely I do. So we get out on the highway, and there's two APCs, which are armored personnel carriers with Vietnam, uh, Vietnamese uh, MPs there, and this one MP says, wait here. So we waited there right. you know you're right. not gonna argue with this guy and we sat there for quite a while and we could see the trucks and and the personnel forming up behind us i mean for miles and finally the the qc's the, the mps are qc's in the vietnamese army they got in the armored personnel carrier and we headed for saigon and we'd move and we'd stop and we'd go and we'd stop and finally, we get just outside of Saigon at the river, at the Mekong River, and the APCs pulled over and blocked the road again. And then the QC come out and waved us through. And then they shut the road behind us. And you could see nothing but Army. Wow. Clear back down the road as far as you could see. So then we go, we head for Saigon. And to get into Saigon, you had to go through the I don't know what it must be the western, northwestern part of the city was Chinatown called Cholan. And we're going through Cholan and we met a mass of people coming out up the highway. They had all four lanes for thousands of people, motorcycles and, and motorcycles and a few cars, but mostly people on foot and they are swarming this highway. We drove up on the sidewalk to get out of the road. And we just watched all these people going by. And I think I said in the book, it was looked like you took everybody in Yellowstone County and herded them up Grand Avenue in a, in a race. Right. And finally, I yelled into the crowd. I said, what's going on? What's going on? And this woman came over and she said, army coming, army coming, leave here, get out of here, army coming. And away she went. <laughs> I didn't want to tell her, but we just left Army coming. Right, yeah, right. You're going the wrong way, lady. Right, right. I know where Army coming is. And, and just out there past the bridge. And you're headed right in there. Yes. So we 
drove off the sidewalk while Chuck Young gets in. He said, let's get the hell out of here, but we still can. So we drove off the sidewalk till we found a side street and we got off that main highway one, it was called. Mm -hmm. And we made our way back to the air base through the suburbs of Saigon. Saigon's a big city. Right. I was real glad to get back to the air base. Right. You felt like you were at least kind of uh, home, right? So I went in, we got back to the company area, and I went in and told the first sergeant what I saw. And he said, yes, we've had word that trouble's coming. So he goes to tell this commanding officer what we saw. And we go down to get some supper, because we've been gone since breakfast. And we finally get back to the base at supper time. And the siren went off, alert. So mm. then it, that's when it started right there. Okay. When the siren went off, we were officially in lockdown. Wow. Did you get any supper? Very little. <laughs> <laughs> Very little. Very little. Okay, so then you go into lockdown. Then what happens? Well, that I, I wrote in the book about the three amazing things we saw that day. Yep. The people coming down the highway, thousands of people. So we get back to the airbase. And the siren goes off, so I get my boots back on, and I go up, and the first sergeant says, go to supply. So we head for supply, and here's supply, and they're unboxing brand new M14s, and they're throwing them on a table out in front. And over here is a pile of boxes, and over here is a stack of ammunition higher than your desk. Grab all the ammo you can carry, and a brand new rifle. And all I could think of was, this is a real stupid time to issue these new rifles. Okay. These old guys have never even seen one. <laughs> 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 but they were throwing them out there, so I grabbed a new M14 and a whole arm full of bandoliers, and I'm going back to the first sergeant's tent to get instructions, which I knew what the instructions were, but I, we're going to go ahead and get them anyway. Right. And I come on this master sergeant who's standing out there in the parking lot between the buildings, and he's crying. Yeah. Older man, probably 45 years old. And he's standing, and I stopped and I said, Can I help you? And he babbled something about he was going to retire in three years and he didn't want to get shot and go to hell. Hmm. And I thought, standing out here in this parking lot is a good place to get shot and go to hell. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is pretty much a recipe for that. Right. I left him there. There was nothing I could do for him. I had other things to do. Right. So I go get my men. I'd already been assigned people and faced them along the fence with their new rifles. <laughs> right. Hoping that will all work out. <laughs> the man was still standing there, and nobody even paid any attention to him. They didn't worry about him at all. They just left him there. Wow. Did you know who he was? Was he? No, I had never seen the man before. He was either a new income or a transit going to another you know, another duty post. Right. But I'd never seen him before, and I never, ever saw him again. Wow. That had to be kind of eerie. So you're you're being handed out new guns, new new everything, and there's this guy crying, babbling. Yeah. Wow. Fear is powerful. Yeah. Now, he was older. Old soldiers know about war. Young soldiers like me, we were too stupid to know about the dangers <laughs> of war. This is exciting. Right, Gra grab it grab your band terminal, but right. it was exciting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was gonna say, I guess it was. Yeah, grab a bandolier and go. So you went in and you reported, and what what was what the sergeant say? Say again. What did the sergeant say? What what was your duty that night? Oh, we we just did guard duty on the fence. We okay. I had men from the front gate to the mess hall about every oh, thirty feet. And we guarded the perimeter of that whole compound. That compound was about the size of, oh, I don't know, smaller than Rimrock Mall compound. And it was fenced with barbed wire and it had concertina wire out around it. And we just laid there and holding our own. Right. What did you see that night? What did, I mean, what did it look like that night? Dark. Okay. Everything was blacked out, no lights on, but... At just at sundown is when a lone airplane strafed the the castle, the the palace, the government palace. Now the government palace was about from our from Tonsonu front gates. It was 
third of a mile is all. Really? So it's really yeah. close. So we all of a sudden we could hear ACAC fire, anti-aircraft fire, boom, 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 boom. Then everybody come out of the bunkers, and we watch this airplane strafing the palace. And hmm. come out and roll around and go back for another run. I think uh -huh. it says in the book, and we stood there and cheered. Who for or what for, I have no idea. <laughs> Just a good show. Yeah, it was a great show. I mean, this is an <laughs> air show that you'll never see again. <laughs> right, right. And so this is the uh, this is the one Air Force plane. Yeah, one try plane. Trying to. was Well, he was working with the Army that was overthrowing the government. He wasn't resisting them. He was helping them. Right, yep. Where he came from. What base he came from or where he went back to, I have no idea, and I don't think anybody else does. <laughs> right, right, that's a government so, secret. After the plane strafed the palace, we went back to our bunkers. Okay. And then they started the fire on the runway. It started firing onto the runway, 50 caliber machine gun fire just all over. I mean, just you looked up in the sky, and all you saw was tracers everywhere. It's, Hmm. And I can remember saying, if every seventh round is a tracer, then there's six of them I don't see. Yeah. And they'd fire for a while, and then it'd get quiet. And then evidently something would go on over at the base, and they'd open up again and cover it with fire. And this went on till it went on all night. Why were they were they just shooting at the? Was this? Uh people who are loyal to Diem shooting, or how, who was shooting at you, and, and explain that. The Army was, was taking over the government, was shutting down all the airports, and okay. they, evidently this was well planned, and they kept every airport in the country shut down. Including yours. Including ours. What, and ours was the main airport. Or, was it scary for you to see that r kind of raining fire and all the tracers? It was concerning. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, we didn't know. The, our only concern was, are the people that are taking over the government are they going to be pro-American or anti-American? If they're anti-American, we're in a world of shit. Yeah. Excuse me. No, no, that's right. You are. <laughs> and if they're pro-American... I don't want anything to do with it anyway. Right, right. Yeah, yeah it, it was a bad situation. And, and if you read the story, uh, this thing was put together by Kennedy and Robert McNamara and a whole bunch of State Department people and a whole bunch of generals, and we didn't have any choice. We're sitting out here wondering if we're going to live through this. Wow. Wow, and what is so morning comes? Tell tell me about the rest of the night. So, you can't really do anything about the gunfire on the runway. No. You just sit there. What, what? How do you finish this out? What? Our instructions were: don't fire unless fired upon. Okay. And they weren't shooting at us. We just happened to be in the road. <laughs> <laughs> don't take it personally. Yeah, <laughs> it was a bad situation. That went on all night. Okay. And the next day. Um, same thing all day long, and I went out with Sergeant Blue, and I, he had a 50 caliber machine gun set up at the front gate, and I wrote about it in the book, and you read it, that uh, uh, the first sergeant told me, he said, if any shooting starts back of the compound, move that gun to the other side of the compound. We hadn't had one cigarette and sure as hell. <laughs> Small arms fire back of the compound. Wow. So we moved the machine gun back to it. Okay. To the back side. And I got some privates off the line, and we built a ring of sandbags around this 50. Now, Sergeant Blue was a, I knew him, and he was a former ranger. And Eisenhower disbanded the rangers after Korea and sent them out to regular Army units, and they weren't very happy about that. But, right. But uh, that's probably why he had the 50 caliber machine gun, because he knew how to use it. Right. So we get the sandbag built, uh, bunker built, and we're standing there, and Blue is out there pointing out targets and, and possible places where we might want to fire into, and a bullet come between my face and hit the back of his head so close you could feel the heat from it. Hmm. And I remember saying, Jesus Christ, that was close. And I grabbed my new M14 that was leaning up against a post, and I bailed into this bunker. 
<laughs> it was at about a foot of water and a foot of mud in it. <laughs> and the, the wall of the bumper was so high, bunker was so high I couldn't even see over it. <laughs> so I'm up there pulling sandbags off this bunker down into the bunker so I got something to stand on so I can fire over the edge of it. And by that time, it, there was no more firing. Wow. So we moved the 50 back to the front. I wrote huh. in the book, we were a two-gun outfit, but we only had one gun. <laughs> so we were very underarmed. Right. I wrote in the book, I said that we, there were no officers in the company at that time, and I have to take that back. Midnight of the first night, somebody called me off the line. I was the, the platoon armorer. I had charge of the weapons connex. And they said two men were coming in from one of the radio sites, and they needed weapons. So I go to the, to the weapons connex, and I'm waiting for them, and I'm standing in there. And I could hear this guy walking up the walkway. We, our walkways between the tents were gravel. And I could hear him crunch, 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 because it was awful quiet. Quiet, right. scary. Yeah, <laughs> right. And he come around, and when he got in where I could see him, I said, halt. And he says, don't shoot, don't shoot, it's Lieutenant Walker. I said, get in here before you get your ass shot off. <laughs> so he comes in the <laughs> and I said, what are you doing here? And he says, battalion sent me down to check and see if you guys had enough guards on the line. And I said, well, how did we do? And he says, looks pretty good to me. And I said, you're taking a hell of a chance walking out there with these guys are a little bit trigger happy. <laughs> right. <laughs> they got new guns and want to use them. <laughs> so we stood in the weapons connex and had a cigarette until my two guys showed up and got their weapons. And then everybody went their own way. He was the only officer I saw during the coup. Wow. wow the so officers lived in hotels in Saigon. Really? And that, they so did you... the four-day week, and we did the work. <laughs> <laughs> now, after the coup, we had officers everywhere. Hmm. Our company had two officers, a CEO and the executive officer. After the coup, we must have had at least five or six running around there. Wow. <laughs> so they changed their tune after that the coup. New, we got a new deal going here. <laughs> right, right. But you felt pretty underarmed and under firepower. I mean, uh, yeah, not a lot of firepower. Way under, yeah. We, we couldn't have held out. We had no heavy, heavy weapons at all. They shut the Air Force down. They shut our helicopters down. And we were at their mercy. One tank could have took us out. <laughs> <laughs> and you probably knew it at the time? Everybody knew that. Okay. So uh, so this happens for how many days do you stay kind of under siege? Well, the second night was pretty quiet. But that's the night I wrote in there that, that uh, they came and said that uh, General Stilwell wanted two radio operators to run his radio combo complex at, the, at MACV headquarters. So Sergeant McCarthy and I were picked, we were so lucky, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to go into Saigon and spend the night there. Okay. And I wrote about that. We drove in and went to MACB headquarters, and we met General Stilwell. He was a two-star general. He was the son of Vinegar Joe Stilwell from the Burma campaign in World War II. And it was, a, it was an interesting... What was he like? Friendly enough person, yeah, right. man about I suppose he was in his 40s. Okay. We go into this room and there was a, there was an Air Force Brigadier General. There was two-star General Stilwell. There was an Australian Colonel that I had met before. There was the General's driver who was a Marine Corps Sergeant. There was Sergeant McCarthy and I, all in this one little room. But everybody met everybody. Right. Yeah, that was kind of nice, you know. Yeah. So what did you do then? What what were what was your job then? Well, uh, this the general's aide told us that we were to go to the radio room and keep it on air in the air all night, and he said if anything interesting happens, I think he called it, let me know. Well, we didn't know exactly what interesting might be, but we kind of figured we might understand it if it happened. But nothing happened that night of any consequence, and the next day we checked out at 7 in the morning went back to the base. Okay. Then Sergeant McCarthy come and got me at noon that day, and he said, let's go to town and see the damage. Now, we're under martial law. Everything's shut down, but we're military under martial law. It don't count. Right. 
So we get back in the truck and we go to town. Well, we get to the front gate and there was an MP lieutenant on duty at the gate, which is very unusual. Where are you going? Because this is Mac V headquarters again. And he waved us through. So we drove directly to the palace. And down the street to the palace was just burnt up and shot out. And I hate to tell you this, but they burnt up three newspapers. No, I. <laughs> it happens. They torched the buildings and put them out of business. You aren't going to write anything bad about us for a month. <laughs> right. About what it amounted to. Right. Well, when you burn the presses, it's hard. Yeah. yeah. Huh. And there were the vehicles that were shot up were laying dead in the street, and there was nobody any place. In oh. a town of a million people, you couldn't get up a bowling league. Really? So we drove over to the palace, and the palace and the palace guard headquarters were shot to pieces. Thousands. There wasn't a window in any of them. And we go around to the side, and there was a little street that went along the west side of the palace, and they had shot a hole through the palace fence with a tank, and there's this big hole, and there's a picture of it in the book there. Yeah. And there was nobody there. There was no police there. There was no guards there. There was no military there. We could have walked in the palace and had lunch. Wow. <laughs> Except there was nobody there. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> was it spooky? I mean, that's got to be kind of eerie. You're Say just, That's got to be eerie, a little bit spooky. Very just, spooky. It was almost weird. There's no people. Right, and it's like, like that, that TV series about the uh, life after people. Right. Where are the people? Right. There was none. <laughs> wow. So then where did you go? I mean, what did then you we do? we went down to the harbor. We drove to the harbor. And down at the harbor was a big statue of these two sisters that supposedly saved Vietnam clear back in year 252 or something from the invaders. And Madame New, who was the self-proclaimed first lady of Vietnam had this, they said she used her features as for the architect that did the design for this, this statue. And this statue was like 40 feet high of these two sisters up on the top. Well, the sisters were laying in the street. Wow. <laughs> they jerked them down and there were no people. Hmm. I mean, all you saw was military. There was a guard on every corner armed and the civilians were locked in, and we went back to the base. And by the, then that was, by the end of that week, they lifted martial law, and then it was one big party. Was it? Yes. Because yeah. Diem was not was not well thought of necessarily. He was, he was kind of a tyrant at in. At yeah, the, but uh, he was better than what they got afterwards. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, Diem was. Sent back. He was actually number two man. Bo Dai was actually the premier of the country, but he had to exile himself to France because of the, the Viet Cong and the Viet Cong, and the, the French came back, and then they run the French out, and they, it, was, it was war zone, so they left the government wide open. So Diem came back and kind of put things back together. Uh, but Saigon was the only safe haven. Uh, the Viet Cong took over all the rural, the little towns. The Viet Cong, in 1963, they said the Viet Cong killed 7,000 government agents in Vietnam just to shut down the government. Hmm. I mean, they killed county commissioners and road commissioners and anybody that worked for the government, they murdered them. And, uh, wow. That, so safe haven, that's why we sent all these advisory teams out into the country, was try to stabilize the country and get these little hamlets, hamlet people back in a, away from the Viet Cong and more supportive to the local government. But Saigon was the only safe haven. There was out there, you were on your own out there in the country. Right, right. So how did life kind of, after the coup, how did how did life change besides uh, you seeing officers around? Uh, the, the the tense level went up real high. Yeah, <laughs> and we we still stayed on the base. And three weeks after that, I left. Okay, a week a, about three weeks after Senator, uh, President Kennedy was killed, and then I came home. Okay, and I went to Fort Carson, Colorado. And. 
when you went home, uh, let, let's talk about going home. When you went home, uh, what did you, was that a happy thing, leaving Vietnam? Yeah, I look back on it as a pretty good incident in life. Yeah? <laughs> yeah but um, it was, I think it was kind of strange that nobody would talk to you about it. Nobody ever asked you about it. Nobody came up and said, what was it like there? until I got to Fort Carson. When you, when you get out of a combat zone, you take the, your unit patch off of your left sleeve and sew it on your right sleeve. And it tells everybody I served with right. this unit. And okay. uh, the guys at Fort Carson would see that and they'd come talk to me what it was like, because they knew where they were going. Right. Sooner or later, you're going. Right. Well, then they made me a, because I think because I had been to Vietnam, they promoted me to sergeant. And well, let's see, the, the Gulf of Tonkin incident was in August 2nd of 64. And right then and there, the buildup started. I yeah. mean, that was the day we're gonna send American combat troops to Vietnam. So Lyndon Johnson sent Major General Autry J. Maroon, am I getting too far into nope, this? No, nope. no. Sent Major General Autry J. Maroon out to Fort Carson to get the 5th Division ready to go to Vietnam. And Maroon was a professional soldier. He knew his stuff. He said, I will personally inspect every man in this division. There's about 11,000 men in a division. Hmm. And he gave the old timers, anyone who was overweight had 90 days to get their weight down to maximum and a lot of old timers signed out. This isn't gonna work. So they made me a drill, an army, uh, a uh, platoon sergeant, because now we are training advanced infantry troops because right. for the buildup. Now I'm training advanced infantry troops, and I never went through advanced infantry. I'm a communications sergeant. <laughs> I had been to Vietnam. That makes you somebody important. Right. So they made me this drill sergeant. Because they didn't have a ton of people over there, right? Yeah, we got all of our recruits for this training. Most of them, I'm not going to say all of them, but most of them came out of Fort Dix, New Jersey. They were from New York and Boston and up and down the East Coast, and they needed some training. Yeah. But we tried our best to impress on them that you know where you're going, you know why you're here, I'm going to try to give you as much information as I can so you don't get your ass shot while you're over there. But I don't think we did a very good job. Right. How do you train somebody? They did it in World War II, but I mean, how do you train somebody that you got to pay attention, you got to do what you're told, you got to know your equipment, you got to know your weapons? There's all these things you got to do. And the guy's 19, he says, I don't know nothing. <laughs> right. <laughs> it was a tough situation. Yeah. What did you, so those are the things that you told them. Is that how you trained them for Vietnam? Just know your weapon, pay attention? Are those the we things? We trained them in weapons, we trained them in tactics, we trained them in equipment. Uh, everything you're going to need to know. And, and I was surprised a lot of guys says, is this what we're going to Vietnam with? An M14 and a helmet? I said, yeah, that's what you're going to go with. Hmm. And that got their attention. Right. They thought they were going over with more? Yeah. They, yeah. <laughs> we're we're going to have General Patton and the 3rd Army come with us. No, <laughs> you're not going to have. But... Uh, so then they, they rotated these training units through the division. So then they sent me to teach communications at the 5th Infantry Signal School. So I'm back teaching what I learned down in Georgia, and this was a good job. But we trained these guys in lineman wire stringing, switchboards, radio telephone, radio, landline telephone. We taught them communications until I got out of the Army. Did you think about staying on with the Army? I would have loved to stay on with the Army, but I couldn't pass the physical. Okay. They threw me out. They threw you out? I wrote in my book, the worst thing about leaving the Army was going from someone who was very important to going to someone who was totally unimportant. Hmm. Yeah. And that was the truth. Yeah. 
Yeah, so uh, so you would say that your time in Vietnam was a good experience? Was what? A good experience? In ways, yeah, but I, I think there's most of life, anybody's life, you don't have a lot of choice. Right. Yeah, there's so many things that we don't have any choice. This is what we do, and this is where we're going to go do it, and you just do it. Yeah. Now, you can choose to do it and do it well and enjoy it, or you can choose to make it miserable. <laughs> and the guys that were there later didn't care much for it, and I think they made it miserable. <laughs> right, right. Did they, um, uh, when you came home, how did you, what happened then? Was it hard readjusting, getting back to normal life? Uh, the adjustment only took about 20 years. Oh. Is that all? <laughs> I think I'm still working on it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, why did you decide to write your experiences down? Why why do that? I think for me that it helped me understand things. Mm -hmm. And what I way? I got a whole lot of things that were loose all put down in a nice little pattern. Yeah. I really do. I think it I think for the for 10 years out of the army I was a kind of an asshole. Okay. I was mad at somebody. Yeah. I didn't even know who. <laughs> Just mad. Yeah. Life was not good. I was the first Vietnam veteran in the Mile City VA hospital in January of 66. Okay. And I was in that hospital from January of 66 until Memorial Day. Hmm. And when I got out of that hospital, I had $13 and a cardboard suitcase and my driver's <laughs> license had expired. Wow. <laughs> it was a tough time. Yeah. And yeah. that's why I lived in Miles City for I lived in Miles City for eleven years. Right, just because the VA hospital was there and I had a job there. Yeah. Did you um uh how did you get over being mad at somebody? How did how did that what was it writing or how did you do that? I moved to Billings, changed my whole life, met a wonderful lady. We got married. And we've been married for 35 years. Congratulations. Well, that, that, that would do it. Um, when people find out that you're in Vietnam, how do they react? There was a little harassment. At, I went to Miles Community College for two years. I took an electronics course there. And there was some smart-ass college boys that thought that they could call me a baby killer. And they found out real quick like that that wasn't a damn good idea. Yeah. And uh, I didn't enjoy it, and it wasn't right. I had a friend, uh, Dale Bachness. He was in that Marine division that was supposedly had killed the babies. And he said, by God, if they killed any babies that day, I must have been on KP because I never saw it. Right. And a lot of things in Vietnam were misconstrued and misinterpreted and misreported. And... We're at war. We kill everything that's in the gun. They have danger to us. And but when it finally makes the newspaper, it's kind of they, it gets a different slant. You know? Right. Yeah. <laughs> it. I think General Custer said it best. He said the people who are most sympathetic to the Indian situation live the furthest away. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, it wasn't that yeah. much different from Vietnam. I think. You'll never understand Vietnam unless you were there. But also, if you were there, didn't matter really right. Right. It was a bad idea. Yeah. And it, they perpetuated it until they flat ass couldn't perpetuate it anymore. And then the whole thing fell apart. Yeah. Is that, looking back on it, is that what... Part of your writing and, and thinking about it, is that is that the conclusion that you've come to now 50 years later? How do you, <laughs> okay. How do you look back at your time when you were over there? I mean, you saw a really interesting piece of history yeah. with the coup. Uh, how do you, when you now looking back with 50 years worth of life, yeah. how do you see Vietnam now? A lot of guys did their job over there and paid dearly for it. And a lot of guys didn't do their job over there and should have paid dearly for it. Yeah. 
you, you, I, like I said, I'm not mad at anybody anymore, but it didn't change anything. Yeah. I have forgiven, but you don't forget it. Yeah. You never forget it, I don't think. I think about it every day. Yeah. Something yeah. will happen. You smell the smells and the sights and the, you know, it's always with you. Yeah. It isn't something you can just push off and say, well, we're not going to, we're not going to do anything about that anymore. We're not going to think about that anymore. You're going to think about that. Yeah. Every day. Every day. Does it, it? I was just in Fort Harrison VA hospital three months ago. Okay. The VA has kept me alive. Hmm. I, I hear a lot of bad press about the VA, and they're, uh, they don't do 100%, but they've done 110% for me. Hmm. Yeah. Did you, um, uh, when you came back, Yes. Uh, and you saw, I mean, you, you came back in 65, and we still had almost another 10 years to go That's in right. Vietnam. Yeah. That must have been hard for you to sit and watch that on the television news every night what was going on in Vietnam wasn't it yeah, i mean could could I you wasn't there. Yeah. yeah was was that hard to even see yes. on the news yeah when i said general maroon said he would inspect every man in the division when he came to me of course i was wearing that vietnam patch and he said sergeant valley i see that you've already been to vietnam i said yes sir 63 he said are you willing to go back with me i said yes sir you lead i'll follow but i didn't get to go okay Wow. See, Lyndon Johnson did the same thing to Audrey J. Maroon in the 5th Division that he did to a lot of things. The division was up to stuff, up to strength, ready to move, and Johnson changed his mind and sent the 1st Division, the Big Red One. And they stripped all the major personnel out of Fort Carson and sent them to Fort Riley, Kansas, and increased the size of that division and sent them over in the 5th Division never went. They dis they finally disbanded it. Huh. Wow. What a waste. Yeah, yeah, especially to get them up and, yeah. With all that money and time and personnel, and then they didn't get to go anyway. Right. Talk about a letdown. Yeah, yeah. When you were over uh, there, did you think uh, on that night of the siege, did did you think you might not come back? Did you ever think, I'm, I'm not getting out of here? Not seriously. Okay. No. I hoped it would. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> a whole lot of guys saying, I hope we get through this, <laughs> yeah. you know. Wait, are you right when you're over there, are you writing letters? What kind of communication do you have with the US, with the states when you're over in the army? I don't think I wrote three letters all the time I was there. Really? I was busy. Yeah, okay. And I like I say, I was older. My family was older. And I write up a note once in a while, let them know I'm still alive. But <laughs> <laughs> What what do you want people today and going forward? You know, one of the reasons I'm recording this is because I want to save these memories. I think they should be preserved. What do you want people 50 years from now to remember about Vietnam from a guy who is over there? Don't believe half of what you hear. Okay. <laughs> they fed us this Vietnam line the domino theory and the, we've got to save Vietnam from communists. Vietnam had nothing of interest to us. We could have given it to the communists and it would have been a detriment to them. Right. So a lot of government, and we, we've gone through a bunch of it here lately, what they say is right is not necessarily the best thing for us, for this country. Yeah. Why do we get ourselves involved in these little hot spots around the world? Let them shoot it out. Yeah. After they get done killing each other for our business, we can go in and and show them what the boys that are arrested can do. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so you see history being repeated then? Oh, all the time. Yeah. Yeah, all the time. But Mike Mansfield went to Vietnam just before I went there. He came back and told President Kennedy that we are just assuming the unenviable position that the French took, and he was right. Yeah. But nobody paid any attention to him. Yeah. Uh, Mansfield, uh, he seemed almost visionary then, didn't yes. he? Yeah. Yeah, he could see it. Yeah. I could see it. Hell, I'm a private farm kid from South Dakota, and I could see it. We ain't going to win this. Right. 
We don't have the the uh, esprit de corps of the people or the army to to overcome this. Not yeah. going to happen. And this isn't this is their home. Yes. If they won't defend it, why should we? Yeah. Plus, they didn't have anything we needed, wanted. It was of no value to us whatsoever that I could see. Yeah. I mean, we could buy our rice from somebody else. They'd already cut down all the teakwood and the, and the mahogany trees. Right. You know? So we're done. It was there that we wanted. Right. Other than to try to stop what we thought was a... Yeah, was stop communism. communism. Well, we tried to stop communism. Cuba couldn't do it 60 miles off our yeah. coast. Right. Couldn't do it. Yep. Now we're going to try it 9,000 miles off the coast. Couldn't do it. Yeah. Insanity. Yeah. Have you ever been back to Vietnam since? No, and I wouldn't go there. Yeah, not interested. I don't need that. Okay. <laughs> when you go to the, have you been to the Vietnam uh, War Memorial in D.C.? I wouldn't go there either. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Uh, so we've talked a, a lot about, you know, it's hard to get an entire military experience condensed into just a little over an hour. It's probably foolish. Yeah, <laughs> Uh, what have I missed about your story that needs to be preserved? What, what what have I skipped over, or what are what else do I need to know? Well, I think we fairly well covered it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there, there. I, if you took everything I've written, it would be a stack that deep. So you still write? You've written a lot about about this, and you said to kind of figure it out for yourself. Is that kind of yeah, why? I think I think that was the. It isn't for publication. I tell you that right. much. Because if you read it, you can say this guy is not a scholar. <laughs> <laughs> they they say that all the time about mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like that. Uh, but uh, it was an experience. It was some good. It was some bad. Um, I think I remember more of the good things than I do the bad things. Yeah, what's what's the best memory you have from Vietnam? Saigon. Okay. If you turn the camera off, I'll tell you why. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about that afterwards. <laughs> okay. Actually, no. The people were nice, and the Vietnamese women that were half French were beautiful. Right. Absolutely gorgeous women. Right. They were. It's a good time to be over there at 21. Yeah. <laughs> did you, uh, uh, did you, it was, so there was beauty in the country, not only from people, but this wasn't just a war zone. It was a pretty country in some respects. Oh, yes. It was a democracy. It was a free country. And I talk a lot about there with, with Kennedy and, and McNamara and the boys plotting to overthrow the government of a free nation. Yeah. It, well, that wasn't our doing. That's not why we were there. Right. We were not there to, to oust a, 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 a fascist government. We were there supposed to be protecting the, the Vietnamese people from a communist invasion, and we invaded them ourselves. Right. And making sense to me, the whole thing went... Yeah. Oh, that, that, that way. Yeah. It's is it kind of disillusioning to to, yes. to see that? I mean, here we we have pretty high ideals of democracy and then we help overthrow we overthrow a, a, a democracy. democracy. Yeah, yeah. If you can make any sense of that, now you wonder why people drink. <laughs> 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 I yeah. still don't understand it. The Ho Chi Minh, who was the leader of the communists in North Vietnam. After the coup said, I can't believe the Americans are that stupid. And he was right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and he was also educated in a democracy, too. Yeah. And, but here's the problem. How do you change what's already done? Yeah. You can't. You can't unring a bell. You cannot ring it back. And how do you change it when you're a soldier in the Army and you, you get orders to go to Iraq? And you think going to Iraq is stupid, but you go anyway. Yeah. So you went anyway. Yeah. Yeah. You do your best. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate you going and doing your best. And I also appreciate you coming and sharing your story because I had not uh, uh, had the opportunity to interview anybody who had been there um, that early.
So uh, early in 63, which are 63, 64, those are good. Uh, that's really important. So thank you. I really appreciate it. You know what I've thought lately? Hmm. The coup would make a hell of a movie. Yeah. Yeah, it would. <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of fascinating, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Uh, did, you, did you have an appreciation at the time uh, that you were witnessing history? Did you? We were witnessing a major world event. Okay. And yeah. you were there, and that, was, uh, that, that must have been kind of a neat. And from there on, it went downhill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true, isn't it? That's yeah. true. History, history says that, too. Well, I just thank you for coming in and sharing your story. It was fun. It was, this was a lot of fun. Thanks for listening. Uh, this has been Vietnam Voices. I'm Daryl Ehrlich with Elwin Valley on September 21st.